Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the grand finale of The Pitch, a comp competition of ideas. It's our fourth annual, but I have to note that it's the first time that we have our contestants here in person, so we're really excited for that today. My name is Kate Kuzminski. I am a senior fellow and the program director for our Military Veterans and Society program, and I'll be your host for today. The Pitch is the Century's premier event to elevate emerging voices in national security. The first round of the pitch was heard, held virtually in April with our panelists here today. The three contestants that we have joining us were the winners of each heat. Sam Pandy won the military modernization heat. His pitch answers the questions, what new ideas, strategies, or reforms could the US Department of Defense implement across personnel, hardware, institutions, or processes to better meet the challenges of the future. Jennifer Lee won our institutions and people power heat. Her pitch answers what specific reform critical to US national security institutions, including structures, processes, and human capital, could improve their effectiveness and public confidence in the face of new challenges. And Anna Blue won the technology and national security heat, as well as our People's Choice Award. Her pitch answers the question, what new ideas in US technology policy, whether that's financial technology, industrial policy, communications technology, or defense technology, can address the growing national security challenges for the United States and strengthen the safety and prosperity of the American people. There are many ways for our audience to participate today. Um, we'll have the chat box up on the entire event underneath the, the video that you're watching now. Uh, there you can give your reactions about the pitches, let us know what you're thinking, let us know what you think about the ideas that are out there, um, and show your support for our wonderful contestants today. To join the chat and participate, you can go to cnas.org slash live. You can also engage with us on Twitter using the hashtag CNAS2023. Um, to give a little test for that, we'll, we'll throw out a question to our audience at home that will come up on the screen. We want to know a little bit more about you and who you are. Um, so let us know what industry you represent and where you're, where you're coming from today. So now a little bit about the process. Each contestant will have three minutes to present their pitch. Once a contestant has finished their pitch, they will answer four questions from each of our esteemed judges. The contestants will have one minute to answer each question. Once all three contestants have gone, the judges will score their pitches on four criteria. The ingenuity and creativity of the idea, the practicality of the idea, the academic rigor, and the clarity, persuasive, persuasiveness, and delivery. While the judges are finishing up their scoring, the audience will be asked to vote for their favorite pitch in the People's Choice Award. And that's where you all come in. The poll will open around 3.30 p.m. And to participate, you'll use the same, uh, you'll, you'll be viewing uh, the, the video live, but you will vote uh, at cnas.org slash vote. And we'll remind our audience when they're able to participate. The contestant with the highest score from the judges will win the best in show, uh, while the contestant with the most audience votes will win the People's Choice Award. Now, just to warn you, we've seen some interesting results in the past. The same person might win both categories. We might have a tie in one or both categories. So we'll let you know how those stack up in the end. Um, so uh, all of our finalists today will be able to publish their ideas in a commentary published by CNAS. Um, and everyone should keep their eyes out for those publications when they're out. Each contestant will also win a cash prize. The winner of our Best in Show Award will also be able to participate in the Sean Brimley Next Generation National Security Leaders Dinner event of their choosing. Let's welcome our VIP panelists, uh, or our VIP judges. So first, I'm going to throw it over to our CEO here at CNAS, Richard Fontaine. Thank you. <laughs> so Richard. You've <laughs> held positions at the State Department, on the Hill, most notably you worked for Senator John McCain. You are well practiced in providing information to a senior leader under extreme duress and uh, under tight timelines. So what advice would you give to our, uh, our contestants today? Great ideas, try to send it by August, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Thanks for that. 
All right, thanks, Richard. So second, we'll move on to our second judge, Michelle Flournoy, co-founder of CNAS, former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, and current chair of the CNAS board. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. So I'm gonna turn the question on you. So I asked Richard uh -huh. what it's like to brief the senior leader, but you've sat in a position where you've been briefed. What has made for an effective pitch from one of your, uh, your employees? Well, I would say first thing is bottom line up front, um, and then uh, be very clear. Assume that you don't have a lot of time. I'm not suggesting that decision makers aren't good listeners, but sometimes they've got busy schedules and they're impatient. So in that sense, the pitch format we're doing here is somewhat realistic. Like if you can't get it across in a compelling way in you know two to three minutes, you may not have a chance for the following conversation. Wonderful advice. Uh, next, we're moving on to Suzanne Tianpour, journalist and CNAS adjunct fellow. Welcome. So you have an impressive background, both in front of the camera as a journalist and behind the scenes. What makes for compelling storytelling in a short period of timeline, in your opinion? So we're in an attention economy, and number one is to know what your audience wants, deliver it, short, sweet, and to the point. Great. And finally, I'm joined by uh, the program director for the Energy and Economic Security Program here at CNAS, Emily Kilcree. Welcome. So you and I both have the great privilege of managing and mentoring rising talent in national security. What's advice that you've given to those on your team? Well, in addition to the great advice you've already heard, I would say write to your own idea of your own storytelling. Mm -hmm. Know where your resources are, have no hints for them. And if you're reading Apple Notes, know what every other agency is going to tell you. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we jump into our pitches, I will just remind everyone of the rules. Each of our speakers will have three minutes to present their idea, followed by a one minute answer to each of our four judges uh, for a question that will be posed specifically to you. Um, I will note for our audience that each of our speakers is speaking in their personal capacity and do not reflect the views of their employer, CNAS, the federal government, or anyone else. Um, and with that, um, I would like to invite Sam up to the stage. Sam uh, will focus here on our audience, and our audience at home will be in that camera there. Mm -hmm. So with that, are you ready? Ready. All right, your time starts now. One of the most important quotes from the movie Top Gun considered to be, you can be my wingman anytime. What this really means is that when you're struggling with something, a huge challenge, you can't do it alone. The DOD and the Pentagon realized this over the past couple of years when they've been trying to scale up their innovation ecosystem. And in order to do this, in the last year, they formed a new office, the Office of Strategic Capital, with the primary goal of two major goals. First off, being that they want to take a percentage of $400 billion in PE and VC capital from the private sector and inject that into the DOD. And two, they want to deliver better value to the warfighter. However, that's not always easy, which is why my pitch today is this that the OSP needs to build a pilot partnership with Army Futures Command and AFWERX in the next six months in order to deliver better value to the warfighter. First, we'll talk about the problem, next, the solution, and last, execution. So first, let's talk about the problem. Headcount is one of the biggest issues facing OSP today. Their footprint in the Pentagon is less than 10 people, and to fix this, they built a partnership with DIUX, which only has a transition ratio of 40%, taking the startup and making it all the way to POR they need to fix headcount. Two, the time to value for a startup to get a POR is very small, and thus crossing the river of death never really gets to VCs that give them confidence to sell to the DOD. And three, finding an executive sponsor who is willing to stay with the startup all the way to them being funded to cross that river of death is also a main issue. But here's where the hope comes in. This is how my solution solves all three of these issues. By actually tasking two detachments from the Army Futures Command and AFWERCS to be directly assigned to this issue, you are putting subject matter experts in front of the problem and directly connecting them to soldiers. So it's not a bunch of wasted DOD dollars. And second, when it comes to the whole time to value for SBIRs and program of records, when you assign one soldier who has an expertise to a specific line item that a due diligence example is gonna be utilized to assess the value of that startup, you can see whether or not that startup makes sense versus wasting money. And lastly, soldiers and airmen have great relationships with end users that are both SAS as well as commanding generals who are willing to see the value in a startup and see whether or not it'll make a difference to the line. 
Now let's talk about execution today. Overall, it can be broken down in three phases that, and here's the good news, it won't really cost a dime and can be rolled out in three to six months. But first phase would just be planning and overall making sure that we define our left and right limits. The second phase will be looking specifically at whether or not we have the right talent from Army Futures Command and AppWorks dealing with the problem. And lastly today, we would execute defining KPIs and benchmarks because let's face it, it's gonna be hard to roll this out and get 100% goal line from the get-go. So this is why this is a pragmatic solution. This pitch could work. And overall, it's a good thing for OSD to consider that it can't do things without a swing. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> All right, so now on to our judges' questions. I'm gonna work down the line. So Richard, we'll start with you. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Um, maybe two kind of related questions. One, um, why don't you need any more money? This is maybe one of the very few pitches I've ever heard for some <laughs> initiative that says we don't need any more money and we're fine with where we are. And then two, you talked about uh, partnering with Army Futures Command and AppWorks. What about other offices and people kind of in this broader ecosystem, Chief Capabilities Office, CIU itself? Like where do you see those fitting in or what would you do there? Those are some great questions. First off, in terms of the money issue, OSC has formed a relationship with the SBA to form a SBIC so they can invest dollars. They already have an OTA, which is an other transaction authority of a certain limit, so they know that they have the money there to invest. But when it comes to actually putting soldiers in front of this issue, it's literally just getting a BA schedule. So just getting a battle assembly together and saying, hey, you're responsible for this startup, this startup, this startup. The, the structure is actually already there. And to your second point, in terms of building relationships with like Army Capabilities Lab, DIUX, OSC has a relationship with DIUX, but they don't have headcount. And two, soldiers from AFC have those relationships already. So we wouldn't need to continue to find more stakeholders. We could limit it to the people that are representing AFC. Great, great presentation. Um, two, uh, one question and a, and a small one. Um, so even AFWorks and Army Futures Command sometimes have trouble having their own programs cross the, that you called the river of death, which was interesting, valley. I called the valley yeah. of death. <laughs> um, no, that's okay, uh, river makes sense too. Um, but um, so is, is there a way that you could get the, the customer that actually has money to speed and scale a program into production into the mix? How do you think about that? Um, and why not the Navy and Marine Corps too? So. <laughs> I'm Army, but I, you know, yeah. it's, it's still, <laughs> no offense, no offense. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, so Naval X and the Marine Corps X, Marine Corps Innovation Lab just got set up like mm -hmm. two months ago in yeah. Silicon Valley. So it's brand new. They're going to get there. Naval X is getting started too. So we'll bring them into the fold after we look with what AppWorks is doing and mm -hmm. Army Futures Command because they know what they're doing, or yeah. at least they're trying to. Uh, to your earlier point um, about customers getting money, VCs are very skeptical about having them sell to the DOD, and that's why they say that if there's a startup, it should be dual use. It should sell commercially, gain revenue that way, and then also sell to the DOD. Mm -hmm. However, I think OTAs, which is what DIUX uses to speed up that timeline and cross the valley, is the way to go. It's faster, and it doesn't require phase one, two, three for an SBIR rep to look at it and like say, okay, we'll talk to you in like two years. Thank you. Thank you for your pitch. I have one specific question, which is that your pitch has specific recruitment needs. How do you tackle that? And how do you tackle conversations with the private sector for the same talent? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So Army Futures Command and AppWorks has a couple of components under it. They have about, they're not battalion sprints, but they're two detachments. And in terms of recruitment, those soldiers are there. Like I'm actually one of them. Um, and you sit actually in a smaller cell. So these soldiers just need to be tasked. In terms of recruitment, it's all really about finding the best quality talent. And mostly when you go back into our reservists who have expertise in the PE and VC sector, as well as in the DOD, that's where you find the best talent. And it's really just putting them on orders. That's a big, I guess, thing that needs to happen. Thank you for an excellent pitch. Um, I wanna ask about failure. That's one of the biggest cultural differences between strictly the startup ecosystem and uh, how did your proposal kind of get over that hump between startups who are supposed to fail early and go off and, and the government where you fail your second time? That's, a, that's another great question, like 95 or 90% 90 of startups fail. Uh, so I think the startups that have been approached in the past are already dual use, so they validated their product market fit in the commercial sector, and now they're trying to sell to the DOD. But I think involving soldiers from AFC and AppWorks can be like, 
this use case makes no sense. And bec they can say that because they know the line unit. They know the product market fit. They know what soldiers and airmen want. And they can validate whether this product even makes sense before we spend a lot of dollars. All right. Well, All right. thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, so while we transition to our next uh, pitch contestant, uh, a little feedback from our, our poll results. Uh, we have 9% of our participants are military, 9% are in public service, and 81% are in the private sector. So good, just a good little background of who filled out our poll uh, up here at the top. All right, so next we'd like to welcome up Jennifer Lee. She is the winner of the Institutions and People Power Heat, and her pitch is entitled, Establish Frameworks for Fully Remote Work to Make Federal Employment More Accessible. Jennifer, are you ready? I am. All right. Ready. Your pitch begins now. Great. The greatest defense our government has is you, me, and everyone in this room, because people power is at the core of our national security. With officials across different agencies underscoring the need for an agile, diverse workforce to meet tomorrow's security challenges. We have a problem. Almost 30% of the federal workforce is over 55. When those talents retire, how do we assure that we have the human capital needed to secure our future? We often constrain our thinking locally, but luckily we have a solution, remote work. Remote work is often conflated with telework, but it should be understood as a discrete tool to find the best talents in the US to staff our national security bodies. While telework is like hybrid work, where an employee in Virginia works from home some days, but ultimately reports to their local DC office. Remote work would allow the federal government to digitally harness the expertise of someone like me living in South Carolina, or say, a nuclear physicist in California, to bring those skills out of state to a major hub. While telework is best understood as a work-life balance issue, remote work is a national security measure. Over a four-month period in 2022, USA job listings that were remote eligible attracted proportionally more women and minority candidates than did the on-site positions. And notably, those same remote listings also drew in candidates from 30 more states than did the on-site positions, where candidates from only seven states applied. However, I mentioned this tool is underutilized. If you look at USA Jobs today, about 500 of 28,000 posts were remote eligible. That's less than 2%. To increase federal utilization of this tool, we need to disaggregate telework and remote work. One way these two streams get confused is because at each agency, there's one person managing both streams, the telework managing officer. So to disaggregate telework and remote work, I propose the creation of a digital opportunity officer, or a doer. The doers would have a remote work portfolio separate from the mandates of the telework managing officer. Since remote work has often been mistakenly treated as extended telework, this has created confusion in determining position eligibility and collecting accurate data, among other issues. The work of the doers can include partnering with hiring managers to reevaluate position eligibility of vacancies, performing remote work policies at agencies, and partnering with DHS and NSA on information security. Changes like these will open the doors to federal work to a diverse pool of applicants from all over the country. Through this reform, I hope that one day the federal government will get to see what we as a nation can do for national security. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jennifer. So we'll go in the same order with our judges. So Richard, over to you. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Um, you read in the newspapers a lot now about companies trying to get their employees to come back from working from home uh, because they believe that you lose something in terms of the culture and the collaboration and so forth. And sometimes there's an equity issue between those who have no commute and those who actually come to the office. So you talked a lot about uh, what the upsides were of your proposal. Do you, can you identify any potential downsides of a higher proportion of the government workforce is working from home rather than in the office? Well, I think that gets kind of down to like this distinction of telework and remote work. We've seen, um, you know, bipartisan uh, agreement that um, people on both sides of the aisle want the federal employees to come back to the office. But um, if you consider the differences between telework and remote work, the teleworkers, you know, were people who report locally to DC, let's say. So um, when they left during the pandemic, you know, you had uh, the local economy potentially suffering from those effects. 
but remote workers potentially are people who are already working remote in other jobs and just not able to contribute their skills to the federal government. So they wouldn't necessarily have that same impact, beca right, because they're not necessarily already commuting into a local economy. Um, and I think that to address your issue um, as well, you know, the data is a little bit squishy in terms of how much of the federal workforce is already involved with remote work. Um, but for the 14% of people in the federal viewpoint survey last year who said they were working remotely, 75% of that 14% were people who um, were located within 50 miles of their local office anyways. So they could effectively be categorized more along as those teleworking lines. Really interesting idea, and particularly for the broader federal government. But on the national security side, I wanted you to ask about how you deal with the challenge of needing to work with classified information. So is it, you know, do you envision remote hubs that people could go to in different cities? Or, and then, re and then the second, part, second question is, you know, in my own experience with, with running a company through the pandemic and after, when the whole, when everybody is remote um, or teleworking, um, you know, it's very difficult to create a sense of culture and community and team. Um, even, especially for new employees that, ne that never have been part of the office. So how do you address that challenge? Thank you. So the classified question is a great question um, and an issue that is very taken very seriously. So telework, the Telework um, Enhancement Act of 2010 actually established a role for the Department of Homeland Security to work with OMB and OPM and everyone to get at that exact um, issue. So that's kind of why I mentioned that the DUA would liaise with DHS. Um, and then you also have NSA, you know, working on um, solutions to utilize commercial level technologies in a layered way in order to um, like create protective, secure access to this classified information. So that's not an issue that will be solved tomorrow necessarily. Um, but like I am looking at this remote access and the ability to like bring in more talent um, to the federal government in a longer term aspect. And since that is something that we've, the government has been working on already, um, I think eventually we'll get to the place where they can address that. And then, I'm sorry, your second culture question. culture and community. Great. Uh, we're going to move on to sorry. Don for sorry. a minute. <laughs> sorry. Yes. Well, my question's kind of close to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Great. How do you make up for the value of human contact, which is often really crucial when it comes to national security work, and then uh, also to also to follow up um, on classified information, I mean, to have the you know NSA be involved and scale up a program that would then specifically be tailored to keeping things classified in remote work places that also requires maintenance to make sure that it's remaining classified because you know adversaries are constantly trying to find ways around. Um, so has that been worked into a budget? Because it sounds like that would be costly. Thank you. Um, so on the topic of culture, I actually started at an all remote workplace um, when I graduated grad school last year. And I have actually found my experience to be extremely close knit and I haven't felt that we're lacking in those cultural values. Um, and then on resources, that is a good question. I was thinking, you know, with the position of the doer, one of those things would be to, you know, work with those teams on this. And since it is just one position, um, I think that agencies can either use an existing person, obviously not the telework managing officer, because that would, like, defeat the purpose of eliminating the confusion. Um, but th that would be up to the individual agency to decide if the doer would be someone who ex already exists at a senior HR level or a new position. All right, up to Emily. Thank you. I love the idea. I did want to ask one more question about a potential downside related to classified information, which I guess is on our minds here. Um, <laughs> is there a possibility that this would actually kind of create a disadvantage for offices or programs that are trying to hire people that will need to be in the office to deal with classified information? You've got this great benefit that'll be available for folks that 
don't have to come into the office to deal with classified information. So is that going to be a disincentive? I think that, again, goes back to, like, the idea of telework versus remote work. You are seeing, you know, agencies currently that have better teleworking um, policies experience um, hopping of their uh, employees to workplaces with more flexible policies. But, it, again, it's not necessarily about work-life balance flexibility. It's about drawing candidates who otherwise could not work in the federal government and having them contribute their skills. And so um, I think it really comes down to how important that distinction is. All right, well, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, so last up, we'd like to welcome to the podium Anna Blue. She is the winner of the Technology and National Security Heat, as well as the round one winner of the People's Choice Award. Anna's pitch is entitled, Invest in Robotics Technology Capable of Mining Metals from Asteroids. Uh, so, are you Can ready? Can I test this real quickly? Easy. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, with that, your time starts now. Precious metals run through almost everything that powers society, from electric vehicles and solar panels to semiconductors and microelectronics. Yet those metals are non-renewable resources, and many studies have suggested that we will run out of several essential elements in the next 100 years. However, there is a more pressing issue at stake for the United States. The U.S. relies on imports for more than 50% of the minerals it consumes. China, in particular, processes 80% of the world's rare earth metals, including cobalt and lithium. Independent access to minerals will ensure the United States can carry out strategic priorities like developing clean energy and building state-of-the-art weapons. The good news is that rather than rely on mineral deposits of unstable or hostile countries, the American government has a feasible alternative, but it's not here on Earth. Here is my pitch to you. The United States should invest heavily in asteroid mining, and that asteroid mining should be carried out by robotic missions. First, let me tell you why asteroids are invaluable resources. Of the roughly 20,000 known asteroids closer than Mars, more than 700 are metallic. One asteroid studied by experts is thought to contain enough iron, nickel, and cobalt to exceed the global reserves of these metals. Mining the 10 asteroids closest to Earth and greatest in value would produce a profit of around 1.5 trillion US dollars. Not only would asteroid mining build wealth, but it would lessen the need for traditional in-the-ground methods of mining, which release toxic chemicals into waterways. Most space mining targets have no atmosphere and experience radiation and extreme temperature swings, making it difficult to set up human mining operations. However, recent advancements in robotics technology can make it possible for robots to approach distant moving asteroids, latch on, and drill for important minerals. Walking and climbing robots, like the space-capable asteroid robotic explorer, known as SCARI, can use in situ resources to power themselves through deep space. Robots like SCARI are only the beginning. They are exploratory technology. U.S. government sponsorship and investment can make large-scale asteroid mining a reality. I recommend the United States create a government-sponsored fund to support domestic space startups and make dozens of contracts available to show that there is a market for space mining work. U.S. government involvement in this space is imperative for three reasons. First, the U.S. government has the authority to establish governance structures that can minimize conflict and encourage cooperation in a resource-rich industry. Second, asteroid mining is costly. The first private companies in the space mining industry went under when they were unable to finance themselves to meet such high development costs. U.S. government involvement will provide momentum in a space where very few investors have the patience to support such a long-term undertaking. Lastly, the U.S. needs to effectively compete with Russia, Japan, India, and the European Space Agency, who all harbor space mining ambitions of their own. In conclusion, the best new idea to support U.S. national security in the short and long term is to fund, build, and encourage asteroid mining via robotic missions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Anna. So for one last time, we'll come down our row of judges. Okay, uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, I guess two questions. One is just a factual question. What's the legal regime for uh, assets in space? Can anybody just go and take as much as they want from any of these asteroids and keep it and deny it to other countries, for example, uh, or for your company, or how does that work? And then also, asteroids seem really far away. 
Um, so is the prohibitive cost going to be only on the development side or also the costs of actually carrying out this activity given that you have to transport really heavy things really, really, really long distances? Yes, um, great questions. On the first question, uh, there's very little legal um, certainty around how asteroid mining operates. I think that's why the U.S. government can play such an important role. Um, they need to clarify a lot of the legal ambiguity. A lot of our existing legal regime is a uh, legacy from the 1960s and 1970s, um, and so I think it really needs to be updated. Uh, the U.S. did adopt the world's first uh, space resources law, and that space resources law basically says that whoever mines an asteroid in space can take those minerals for their own company, their own country. Um, and so I think that law is maybe the baseline, the foundation of what could become, with more U.S. investment and involvement, um, an entire legal regime that could outline maybe different principles like equality, uh, sustainability, to really make sure that space mining is carried out appropriately. And then on the second question, um, <coughs> It's a really good question. The U.S. Um, has, uh, well, I'll answer this really quickly. I see I'm supposed to wrap up. But the U.S. did send OSIRIS-REx to a really far out asteroid. And um, that uh, OSIRIS-REx is in the process of returning from the asteroid with a sample of minerals. Um, and that trip is taking a long time. I think there are some ways to avoid um, cost prohibitive issues, for instance, um, seeking fuel in outer <coughs> space, maybe converting water into fuel for the robots, and thereby making trips more affordable. Great. Oh, really interesting presentation, really creative. Um, but there's a lot of basic science here still to be worked out and a lot of R&D. So I wanted to get a sense of you from you, given the baseline of where we are, both how long do you think it would you know, <coughs> take to really get to the point where we could reliably send a mission to an asteroid, you know, mine it and bring it back? And what kind of cost investment um, are we, we thinking about up front? Because that obviously has to inform whether there's really a business case for this ultimately. Yeah, definitely. I think it's hard to provide an exact timeline, but I will say that there is precedent for the U.S. government getting involved and speeding up the timeline on previously like unheard of or unthought of um, things. So for instance, um, NASA awarded nine lunar payload service contracts in November 2018, and I think that really jump-started the lunar transportation businesses that we're seeing thrive now. And so I do think that regardless of whether or not this is five years out, 20 years out, um, I think it'll be important that the U.S. get involved now. Um, Japan is a U.S. ally that's currently working on this issue, and they're actually one of the funders of SCARI. Um, which is the robot that is currently capable of walking and climbing on asteroids. And that robot was quickly developed between par in a partnership between Japan and a private company. And I think that just shows that the technology can be there more quickly than we might imagine. All right, Suzanne. So I once hosted an episode of the BBC podcast, The Inquiry, on autonomous weapons in warfare, and some of them became killer robots. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you keep the robots that are mining the asteroids from going rogue? This is a question I did not anticipate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, well, I think it really goes back to creating a strong legal regime um, and establishing good governance laws. Because if the US can set up a legal regime that forces you know, private companies or other countries to dictate where they're sending their robots, how they're sending their robots, how they're staffing or supporting their robots, I think that will give us more accountability and transparency in this space. When it comes to the technology mutating into killer robots, um, I think <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time seeing that happening just based off of how the robots have been built. Um, I think a lot of them are like converted robots that were mobile on land um, or have been built off of similar models. Um, and a lot of them, I think, ideally will be remotely controlled from Earth um, or even from nearby, maybe the International Space Station or from companies operating in outer space. And so hopefully there would be a little bit more of a network to rein them in if they got out of control. <laughs> I don't know how I follow that <laughs> <laughs> my boring geopolitical question. <laughs> 
But to go with the boring geopolitical question, um, you mentioned you know competition with other countries. There's also, of course, avenues for cooperation, hopefully with partners like Europe and Japan. How does the United States guide the development of this kind of whole new frontier in a way that does encourage that cooperation? And specifically, like, how do we manage the dynamic with countries that we're not engaging in a lot of cooperation with right now? We don't want to open up another domain of competition. Yeah, so I, this may be overly optimistic, but I think space is maybe one of the few areas where collaboration has been sustained to bu despite like negative dynamics and antagonism on Earth. And I think the International Space Station, although it's coming to an end, is a, is a good evidence of that. Um, I think there is a lot of potential in terms of um, like collaborating on actual experiments and programs. So for instance, NASA is currently working on Artemis, which is um, a multinational effort to, um, you know, re-explore the moon and lunar resources and materials. And so I think that sets a good example for how collaboration could take place between the U.S. government and its traditional allies. Um, when it comes to navigating relations with countries, for instance, like Russia and China, I do think it may be important, and I know this might be everyone's least favorite thing in the world, but maybe to set up um, an agency or organization that's international and exists outside of the United Nations, um, because that would maybe give it a fresh start and um, some you know, momentum that could help um, like lay the groundwork for collaboration in space. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all of our judges for your thoughtful questions and to all three of our contestants. Um, so. All right, so right now we're going to open up voting to our online audience uh, for our People's Choice Award. So I'll walk you through how that works again. Uh, to vote in the poll, go to cnas.org slash vote. Uh, and don't forget to tweet uh, using the hashtag CNAS 2023. Let us know what you're thinking of the ideas that you heard today. I think all three were super innovative um, and, and really fascinating to hear. Um, I'm going to buy a little time for our judges as they, as they submit their, their, uh, their votes for our, our contestants. Um, so a reminder of the four categories that they will be rating for each of our speakers today. The first is ingenuity and creativity. Does the speaker present a new idea, a new perspective on an old idea? Does the pitch identify and propose solutions for an overlooked problem or provide a creative or original way of solving a well-known existing problem? The next thing our judges are looking at uh, was the practicality of the idea. Are those recommendations practical and constructive? Did the speakers take into account the resources necessary to implement the idea? Then they looked at academic rigor. Did the speaker incorporate data, facts, and or other supporting information? Did the pitch logically progress through its con conclusion? And lastly, they were evalu evaluated on clarity, persuasiveness, and delivery. Was that delivery engaging? Did the judges understand the pitch? Was the pitch structured appropriately? And was there a clear problem and a recommendation for that problem in the pitch? So, uh, as our judges continue to, to think through their responses, I'm going to open it up for a, a couple of questions uh, for, for the group. So, Emily, we, you and I, are both program directors here at CNS, and we have had to pitch our research to a variety of audiences, whether that's a foundation we might be pitching for future research, a member of Congress, or their staff a senior uniform leader who we might brief in a different way than we brief a civilian leader. So how do you think about audience when you are pitching an idea? It's a, it's a great question, and it's when I think about all the time, you know, working on economic security issues, I'm often, for example, briefing members of the military about economics, which they're interested in, but not their background, or I'll be briefing economists about national security issues. And it's a very different audience, and I think the key is always to think of yourself a little bit as a translator. Um, you know, you're translating between those different domains. What is the number one thing that keeps your audience up at night, and how do you make your topic relevant for that audience? It's really about listening and kind of showing that empathy to what their core concerns are as you think about how to structure your brief. And Suzanne, you really think about things in terms of a narrative arc. Mm -hmm. you, you both in the drafting of concepts and ideas that you want to put out there and in the actual execution as a journalist. 
So tell us a little bit about your process there. Well, it's kind of like what I said at the start. We live in an attention economy. So for me, when I'm creating a narrative arc, I want to make sure that I can capture the audience's attention, no matter who it is, from start to finish. I don't want them to click away, scroll away, tune out, etc. fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And so I think consistency and keeping keeping it exciting throughout your pitch, throughout what you're presenting, and having key buzzwords that you know is going to you know, wake them up if they start to kind of veer off. That's great, that's great. Um, so we're, we're going to transition into uh, a little interlude here. Uh, here at CNAS, we have uh, the Base of Itch Award presented each year to rising junior staff members and um, our, our mid-level folks um, and I'm going to invite Richard to the stage. Thank you, Kate. This is always a very special time for CNAS uh, during our year, the presentation of the First Lieutenant Andrew J. Basevich Jr. Award. Uh, today we are celebrating and inviting and recognizing uh, emerging leaders and uh, new voices uh, in national security. The, Basevich Award is an opportunity for us to recognize one of our own uh, who has uh, gone kind of above and beyond uh, the call of duty when it comes to the mission of CNES in terms of uh, producing uh, new and innovative national security policies. This award was uh, established in honor of First Lieutenant Andrew J. Basevich Jr., who was killed in combat uh, during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Throughout his life, Lieutenant Basevich uh, exemplified service to country, his values, commitment to public service, and really in so many ways represented the best of America. And uh, this is the kind of example and the kind of record to which I think everyone, uh, certainly at CNES, aspires uh, to emulate. And this award was uh, established to recognize annually uh, emerging leaders who exemplify courage, integrity, a commitment to public service. Uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Basevich and his family um, again this year for allowing uh, the use of, of their family's uh, name and, and to us to be able to do this in honor of First Lieutenant Andrew uh, Basevich. It's my great pleasure to introduce this year's Basevich Award winner for 2023, Jake Penders. <laughs> Jake is the Associate Director of Development at CNES. In his four years here at the center, he has gone above and beyond in his support of our research programs, of our colleagues. He's contributed significantly to the, the business side of our team that's so critical to executing our mission. He's thoughtfully expanded the center's reach, our influence, our base of support. Jake encourages, he assists those on his team and across the center, both professionally and personally, and both in his work ethic and in his mission-driven attitude, Jake exemplifies the spirit of the Basevich Award. So we're very pleased to be awarding it to him today. So Jake, I'm about to hand you the award and the floor, if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you very much, Richard. Very kind and thoughtful words. And thank you for everyone for being here today and taking the time out of your day, especially amidst the crazy weather that we're having outside on the Eastern <laughs> Seaboard. Um, and thank you for all the viewers online as well for tuning in. First and foremost, I want to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Basevich, Nancy Basevich, and the whole Basevich family for allowing this award to be bestowed onto me and for CNES continuing to honor Andrew's legacy. It's truly a tremendous privilege. Next, I'd like to thank CNES's co-founders, Michelle Flournoy and Kurt Campbell, for having the foresight to create the Basevich Award from the very beginning, thus encouraging a culture of selfless service in the organization that is rare to find in Washington, D.C. I'd also like to thank CNAS for providing me the opportunity to be up here in the first place. It's rare nowadays to say that you both grew up in and grew with an organization, but this has been my experience with CNAS over the past four plus years, both personally and professionally. I am extremely grateful to do this under the leadership and direction of Richard Fontaine. 
Thank you for your commitment to CNAS, its mission, and most importantly, its staff. Additionally, thank you to Paul Share for your belief in me over these past few years to really grow into my role at the organization. And Anna Saito Carson, thank you for all the encouragement, support, and wisdom you've shown me since I started. Allison Francis, I know I would not be up here without you, without your teaching and mentorship over the past few years in the world of finance and accounting. So thank you. Next, I'd like to also thank all past Space Fitch Award winners, many of whom have been my colleagues and good friends over the past few years in Washington. I am honored to join your ranks and to be listed among you. For all the CNAS staff, from program directors to RAs, to publications, communications, and operations staff that I've worked with over the years, thank you for everything. This award is not possible without you and your hard work at this organization. To my development colleagues, both past and present, thank you. As a former collegiate rower, I equate my experience with fundraising and my colleagues here on the development team as the engine room of the organization, which is generally seats three, four, five, and six in the boat. <laughs> you are the powerhouse working hard to achieve the goal and mission of this great organization. And finally, thank you to my wonderful wife, Shannon, and my parents and siblings for all the unwavering support, love, and belief in me. For the remainder of my remarks, I'd like to focus on three main pillars or tenets that I strive to live by in my life, but I also believe fall under the, and encompass the base of which award here at CNAS. The first is humility and integrity. For those who know me well, I am not one for talking about myself. I instead focus on the idea of leading by action and by example. Qualities that I've learned and developed since my time in the Boy Scouts, culminating in my Eagle Scout award over 10 years ago. I bring these attributes to my personal and professional life, hoping to demonstrate that you don't need to be the loudest voice in the room to make genuine impact in your job and with others. The second is worth eth ethic and dedication to others. There's a quote my father instilled into my siblings and I as we were growing up that is attributed to Vince Lombardi, a fellow Fordham University alumni like myself. It goes, do a job, big or small, do it right, or don't do it at all. These words have always stuck with me, whether it's folding laundry, cleaning the dishes, working on a grant application, spending hours cleaning up our internal database, or working on fit favorites with family and friends. I strive to approach everything with the right mindset, right manner, and right intention. Actions are important, and being thoughtful in how you complete them does make a difference and a lasting impression on, on others. The third is family, but more specifically, the CNAS family. I only see my success here as the success of CNAS and its role not only for the American public, but also the world. I work tirelessly to make sure that what I do at CNAS is only an extension of the impactful work our researchers undertake in their studies, and I strive for meaningful connections to ensure we all come out on top together. And at CNAS, making long-term connections and propelling up the next generation of leaders is the core identity of the organization. There's a neat emoji that some of our staff had designed a few years back in the depths of the COVID-19 pandemic that is, a shape, that is a shape of a heart, but with our CNAS shield and colors filled in. We use this to congratulate others, propel individuals forward, say thank you, and much more. This symbol defines the CNAS family. Thank you again for your time and for the gr this great honor and for all the responsibility that comes with it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jake, for, for those really truly moving words. Um, so we've got a little time while, while our uh, votes are being tallied. Um, I'd like to turn the a question over to Michelle. So Michelle, I look out at this room today and what I see is the fulfillment of a vision that you and Kurt Campbell had when you started CNES, both providing a platform for young thinkers to uh, get their ideas out into the world, to, uh, to the Basevich Fellowship. Um, can you speak a little bit about what it was that made you think CNA, or DC needs another yes, think tank, right. um, and, and how we yes. would be different? Yes, so um, 15, more than 15 years ago, um, when Kurt and I had this crazy idea that Washington needed another think tank, almost every one of our mentors uh, said we were crazy and told us not to do it. Um, and, but as we thought about it, we, you know, we both had had a lot of experience in other think tanks, um, a decade or more, and we really believed there was um, room for a different formula. And there were many aspects of that, so I won't go through the whole thing, but one of the most critical was that we wanted the product of the think tank, not just to be the policy ideas and the reports, but the actual people. And you know, in a lot of, I had worked in several think tanks where as the junior researcher, I could write literally half a book and not have my name on, come out on that book. Um, and uh, so we vowed when we started this, we are going to make sure that young people have a chance to get credit for their work um, as a contributor, 
Um, they will get training, professional development training, whether it's media training or public speaking, the pitch, you know, all of uh, our next gen programs. So we, we developed a whole suite of pro programs, not only for the staff, but to bring in a broader and more diverse community of up and coming national security leaders um, and to offer professional development experiences for, for them. Um, and, you know, I, we've, I think the fact that CNAS has populated over time so much of the national security cadre and the reputation that, oh, if someone came out of CNAS, they're going to be very high quality, that reputation is there. One of my favorite moments when I was undersecretary for policy, and I was a little bit, I don't want to say insulted is too strong, a little bit peeved that, you know, Secretary Gates had spoken at like every other think tank, not CNAS. And so I said, sir, you know, why aren't you speaking at CNAS? He's like, if I want to see people from CNAS, I just have a staff meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think we've, we've really um, stuck to that goal. This program is part of that, and it's one of the things I am most proud of. Because, you know, you can have policy impacts that, that endure, sometimes they're ephemeral, but the really, the most enduring impact you can have is on the people that you've helped develop and then encourage to um, spend a career in public service. So um, thank you for, to all of you who are, you know, helping make that vision real. And Richard, you have the longest sustained tenure here at CNAS, <laughs> and you've worked with many of the folks who've come through our doors, whether it be the pitch, uh, our next-gen national security leaders, our staff. What, what are some of the, the things you've seen that make CNAS stand out? Well, first, I think it's um, what we try to do is provide an environment and a platform where people can express their ideas freely and the bolder, the better. They should be rigorous and they should be uh, practical, but they should be bold and they should be pushing the envelope. And if you're young, uh, whether you're an RA or an intern or anything like that, then we want you to be able to uh, generate the kind of ideas that ultimately can move the needle in the policy debate. I do think that that's a little bit different than some of the other places. And now I've been here long enough that folks who started here as interns have way surpassed me in the career fields of their <laughs> choice. And people that I mentored, uh, now I now go to for advice uh, and things like that. So, you know, there is a pay it forward and sort of feedback loop um, from all of this. But, you know, there's nothing more fun than having uh, a dynamic environment in which people can test out new ideas, be able to inject those directly into the policy making process. Um, try out new ideas with their colleagues and ultimately come out with something that's greater than the th sum of its parts of just a collection of kind of experts in different fields. So um, that's, I think, what keeps us going. Yeah. So to those bold ideas, I got to note that our results are in. So uh, first, we'd like to welcome the chill or Kimon goes first. Sorry, lost my page. <laughs> um, Suzanne. Okay. Suzanne, we'll call you up to the podium uh, and you will present our first award. This is so exciting. <laughs> and the People's Choice Award goes to Anna Blue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. All right. And that means that Michelle will be headed up to the podium to reveal our Best in Show Awards. Hold this and open the envelope at the same time. Okay. We were tempted to say La La Land once. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the winner of the Academy Award, no, <laughs> the Best in Show Award for the 2023 pitch is, drum roll, Anna Blue. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Very well done. All right. Uh, a, a, a number 
of thank yous are due to the people in this room who made this event happen. Uh, to Jasmine Butler, our events manager. Uh, to our entire production team who is behind the wall or behind the camera for those of you at home. Um, and then a special thanks uh, to Emma Swislow who uh, took the lead in coordinating this year's event. Um, so a huge thank you also to the CNAS staff who reviewed the pitches that came in. Every year we get so many good draft pitches at the first step and then we move on to our first stage uh, which our, our uh, finalists made it through and then to, to today. So we thank everyone who, who had a role in making that happen. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Richard to close us out, not just from the pitch, but from the CNAS 2023 Annual Conference. Thank you. Well, this is the last event of the Annual Conference in 2023 here at CNAS. Um, I hope that everyone who's participated here and those who have tuned in have enjoyed three days of events that we began on Tuesday uh, and took something away from it, an insight, an idea, uh, something that you can use in the course of your work and thinking in national security. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, a couple of uh, folks, or I should say I th should thank a couple of entities, um, Axios, for being our media partner with this, uh, the sponsors of the conference, American Rheinmetall Defense, the Boeing Company, GE Aerospace, and Palace Advisors, who've helped make all of this possible, and the other supporters of CNAS who make all of our work uh, possible. We're really grateful uh, to you. If, I know this is very unlikely, but if you missed any session of the annual conference, all of that will be available uh, for your viewing pleasure uh, on YouTube. And you can continue the conversation by using uh, hashtag CNAS 2023. Uh, thank you to all the folks that Kate thanked, not for this, just for this session, for putting on uh, this conference. Th those of us who get to sit here and listen to good ideas, I uh, get to enjoy the benefits of much hard work from uh, our communications team and from so many other people across this organization. So uh, thank you to them, and we will see you next year. Thanks a lot. <laughs>